on marriage, entitled Marriage Matters. And today we tackle the second message in which I'm trying to actually elaborate on the first message from last week, which gave more of a high-level view, sort of a broad perspective on marriage. And so we want to develop and cultivate certain themes and practical applications from the first marriage. And so that's what we'll try to do here today. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your Bible apps or just simply would like to look up on the screen, the passage this morning comes from what many consider the classic text on marriage, Ephesians 5 verses 21 to 33. So if you could rise for the reading of God's word, and I pray that your hearts and minds would be open to this. Ephesians 5, starting with verse 21, and continuing along to verse 33. This is the word of God. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with a word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated at this time. I do, as I begin this message, actually in this entire series, want to give credit where credit is due, and obviously the primary source is going to be uh, the Bible, but some of the practical applications and some of the wisdom that I glean from applying these verses about marriage come from other marriage books that I use uh, for myself and my own marriage, as well as uh, other Bible studies and sermons, as well as uh, counseling and marriage counseling. So if you're interested in learning or reading more about this stuff or just want to know where I get some of these practical applications or sort of nuggets of wisdom, uh, there are three books that I use primarily, and first is Tim Keller's Meaning of Marriage, Uh, Many of you have known about this book. Second, which is my go-to book, is a counselor by the name of Winston Smith, and he has a book called Marriage Matters, in which I took the title of the series. Uh, That's the beautiful thing about preaching. You don't really have to come up with anything new. Just give credit where credit is due and regurgitate all the great stuff that's out there. And the third book that I use is actually from another counselor, Paul Tripp, and he entitled and wrote a book called uh, What Did You Expect? And more for premarital counseling. So those are the three books that I sort of referenced throughout this series and gleans, again, some practical applications for, for marriage. And so if you're interested in that, uh, please look that up, and I could give you the titles again. Now, having said that, we want to continue along in our series, and we want to cultivate some practical applications from last week's message that gave us a broad view about the vision of marriage from God's perspective. You know, it's funny because when I was in college, I got sort of accused of considering this movie, uh, actually a Brad Pitt movie called Meet Joe Black, and they said, this is my favorite movie. That's what they always told me. Actually, it's not, but it does in that movie have one of my favorite scenes, maybe the greatest romantic scene in the history of cinematography. And if you've ever seen this movie, and I'll make it quick, uh, basically you have Anthony Hopkins, he plays a rich guy, he has a daughter played by Claire Forlani, and in their helicopter ride going to work, uh, he says this to her and says about her current relationship, there's no excitement in your relationship. I want you to have that spark. I want you to have that sort of charisma. I want you to find, fall in love and be taken, swept off your feet. And then the daughter says back to him, "Uh, you're asking for a lot, Dad. And then the dad says, who knows, lightning may strike. And then the movie continues, and she goes into this coffee shop to take notes and get a cup of coffee, and there, behold, is the beautiful man, Brad Pitt. And he's on the phone, he's a lawyer. And to begin this conversation, if you haven't seen the movie, it's the greatest romantic scene in the history of cinematography, and I don't have the propensity to elaborate or to really exaggerate. But he's charming, and he's sophisticated, and he really speaks into her heart, and they resonate, they talk about life trajectory, Um, They kind of pour their coffee, they pour their milk, they pour their sugar simultaneously, so they feel that they have this chemistry. They spark this sort of charisma between them. And as he begins to share his thoughts about marriage, he says, well, I'd give up my work for the woman I love. No, what's wrong with that? She gives up her stuff for me. We take care of each other. What's wrong with that? He's like, you're a one-woman man? Yeah, I think I am. And then she says to him, well, you'll have a hard time finding a woman like that. And then he responds to her, well, I don't know. Lightning could strike. And then all of a sudden, her eyes go really big. And if you want to see what happens after that, go watch the movie. (laughs) 
But I share this story because that's when I first saw it in college, and I thought, that's how it's going to work with me. And I imagine that if you're married, that's probably how you thought would happen with your spouse now. And if you're single, that's what you're aiming and you're hoping for, a scene like that where immediately there's this chemistry and there's this lightning that goes between two eyes. But actually, marriage is really tough, and oftentimes it doesn't happen like that. I think a more accurate picture, if not pessimistic, is a friend of mine from New York, and this is how he sums up his marriage that was longer than me, kids older than me, kids at this time maybe like 12 and 9 years old, and this is what he says. In the first years of our marriage, it was great. Then we had kids, and it was horrible. Now the kids are older, here we are. That's probably a more accurate description of many of our marriages and how we feel. But I want to say that it doesn't have to be that dark or pessimistic because what the Apostle Paul gives us here in terms of practical application is that marriage is hard work, it's laborious, it's difficult, it challenges and stretches you, but when by the grace of the gospel and the grace of Jesus you can live marriage out, it's glorious. That's how it works. Ask people who are married and been faithful to Jesus. And as we said last week, God's vision for marriage is essentially for personal holiness, not personal happiness. That the vision for God's marriage is for his own glory. That marriage serves as a window into these gospel realities that we cultivate and live out and really want to apply in our lives. It's about gospel realities and personal holiness, not about personal happiness. Not sort of this apocalyptic romance as Ernest Becker has written about. But many of us may consider and think about it, well, how do you work that out? What does that really mean, Pastor Will? How can you work out in marriage with this vision about personal holiness? That's what we're going to try to develop here today from Ephesians 5. We're spending maybe the rest of our series on this one passage, so get comfortable with it, read it for your family worship, your devotionals, and memorize the passage. We're going to spend our time and rest here for the majority of our time in this series. But today we're going to look at what does it mean to cultivate a marriage with this vision of personal holiness, not personal happiness, to experience and to apply these gospel realities. There are three things that I want to consider here today about developing this vision for marriage. First, you need a gospel motivation. Secondly, you need a gospel love. And third, you need gospel communication. Those are the three things. Ideally, you could apply this to all relationships. All relationships apply the same way. You want gospel reality in your relationships and friendships. You need a gospel motivation, a gospel love, and you need a gospel communication. But it's true especially in the uniqueness of marriage because they're joined in one flesh. No other relationship will be that important, that intimate, than the person that you are united to, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You need gospel motivation, gospel love, gospel communication. If you don't have any of these, then you'll never have and live out the experience and the vision of God's marriage for your life. So let's see what the passage says here today. Gospel motivation. Let me key off in verse 21. This is what it says. Uh, Sort of just the second half of Paul's thought. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's really the key, the power to the entire teaching on marriage and relationships. You want to know the power. You want to know the key. You want to know the motivation. That's there given to you in verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, the word submit there in the grammar is actually a participle, and it's actually a subordinate verb, means that it explains or modifies the main verb. The main verb comes to us in verse 18, which says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's Paul's main command. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, let me explain to you what that means. And he gives five participles. The last one is submit. Submit yourself to the authorities that are over you. That's how you explain and really sort of elucidates the main verb, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So submitting is a participle dependent upon the main verb of verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Literally submit means arrange your life under authority. Or what they say in the middle sort of tense, it's really order yourself, order oneself under the proper authority. That's what submit means. You order yourself under the proper authority. So when you go to school, you go to classes, you study, you order your life under school. When you go to work, you order your life under work. You have to wake up in the morning, you have to go to work, you have to submit yourself to the boss. So it's not a question about what has authority over you. It's really how you order your life under the proper authority. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ is the key, the power to the rest of the passage in which he elaborates on relationships. Well, what do you arrange or order your life under? Marriage, husband and wives, children, parents and children, and work, employees and boss. So he says this is very practical. And the motivation to do this, which is the first point, to order your life under the proper authority in marriage is fear of Christ. 
It says they're actually reverence, but fear is stronger. You know, a worship, a deep, intimate, cultivating a sense of awe and reverence. So that if you don't have a reverence for Christ as a beginning starting point to fuel and catapult your marriage, you'll never have the biblical vision for marriage. Jesus is the most important thing. You need to love Jesus more than you love your spouse. And let me try to explain it this way. C.S. Lewis, that in Four Loves, says this, and many have read this book, says that there are four loves, and he explains the difference between two types of loves. He says there's eros love, romantic love. Eros love, romantic love, is basically erotic love. You look at each other, and you, lo- look, you, love how you, lo- love, you love how you look at each other, how each other looks. So you just look at each other, and you're like, wow, now I feel attracted. Now I want to date you. But he says, actually, a deeper love is what he calls friendship love, phylos love. Phylos love isn't us looking at each other, but side by side, two friends looking at something beyond themselves. Because in order to make the relationship deep and intimate, you can't look at each other. You've got to look at something more similar and fundamental than yourself. Two people side by side, same vision, looking at Jesus. Phylos love. And so that's the sort of the idea that Paul is talking about. If you want a good marriage, it's not to look at your spouse, say, I love you, you love me. But actually, you've got to look at something side by side to the cross, to Jesus Christ. You have to fear Christ and love Jesus more than you do your spouse. Now, practically, this is what it means. It's interesting how the Bible is so wise in describing idols in our lives. But it says, essentially, fear Christ, find your sense and identity in him. That's what fear means. And then Paul fleshes his motivation out in the following verses and says, well, don't find your identity in spouse, in your wife or husband. Don't find your identity in children. Don't, children, don't find your identity in the approval of your parents. And don't find your identity in work. No, some things are never different, right? Those are the three common idols in our lives. We love our spouse more than Jesus. We love our children more than Jesus. We love our parents more than Jesus. We love our work and money more than Jesus. If you have that paradigm, you're set for destruction. Paul is saying, if you want want to be catapulted into a vision, God's vision for marriage, you need to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Find your sense of self, your identity in Jesus. Find your approval and acceptance in the love of Jesus upon the cross for you. So if in marriage, the ultimate source of your life is your spouse, your identity is your spouse, you're going to freak out. You're set for destruction. You're going to be devastated because your spouse will never give you what Jesus can. If you place your hopes and dreams, your sense of identity in your spouse, you're set for destruction. You're set for a hopeless life because you have to put your identity in Jesus. Your spouse can't bear the weight of your idolatry. Your spouse can't bear the weight of your transcendent desire to find acceptance. Only Jesus can bear that weight. You see, friends, let me explain this. Stereotypically, no, I know it's generalizations, hopefully not sexist, but stereotypically, this is what they say. Men use love to get physical satisfaction. Women use love to get emotional security. Do you see this? And so sometimes when you fall in sin, there's that cycle because men will tell the girl what they want to hear to get physical satisfaction. The woman will give up physically in order to get the emotional security. That's generally speaking how this sort of idolatry works. So in other words, for males, for men, for guys, brothers, your love idolatries make you addicted to being independent so that you can essentially sort of play the field. In other words, the challenge of the male identity, the male idolatry in relationships is essentially physical satisfaction. But this is how guys usually, well, maybe I shouldn't generalize, but oftentimes they say guys work like this. They don't want the spouse to change their lives. You know, they want to, they just want the spouse to fulfill their needs, to satisfy their preferences. But don't try to change me. Let me watch TV when I want to. Let me drink what I want to drink. Let me try to just throw my clothes around where I want to clothes, but I, where I want to throw them. But don't try to change me. I am who I am. Accept me for who I am. So that's sort of their ideology, physical satisfaction, preferences, needs, but at the same time, don't change me. Whereas they say for sisters... For the females, their love idolatries make them addicted and dependent. So that means basically that they open their hearts up, they're vulnerable, they're more easily manipulated, not because they're more foolish, but because they're sort of built differently, maybe. And so this basically says that they'll do anything to get emotional security. So they'll say anything and do anything. They'll serve their boyfriend or their spouse to get emotional security, safety. So men, they want to keep their independence and get physical satisfaction. Women, they'll change things because in their spouse, they love their spouse more than Jesus, so they get emotional security. And then you have an endless cycle of slavery into relationships. Both blind men and women, and then you can't make wise life, wise life choices, and then it distorts their lives. Because again, the spouses can't bear the weight of your transcendent expectations, your godlike expectations. And Paul is telling us this. He says, if you put godlike expectations on your spouse, then you'll have godlike disappointments. Godlike expectations on your spouse, cosmic devastation. 
That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to allude to. In other words, friends, I said this, the ultimate source of life has to be Jesus. That Jesus is the only way that could guard yourself against disappointment because your spouse will disappoint you. They'll sin against you. They'll hurt you. The only way that you could have gospel spiritual capital, sort of a relational buffer, to absorb the difficulties of marriage is if you fear Christ first. Verse 21. Submit to everyone out of reverence for Christ. That gospel will give you the catapult, the power to absorb the relational difficulty. That if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that'll give you the ability to absorb the sins and the words and the disappointments in life, especially in marriage. So this is what it means practically. Jesus, out of reverence for him, Jesus, in verse 21, has to push your spouse out as the most important person in your life. Also, when we get, if we ever did it, you have to push your children out of the most important in your life. Children has to put your parents, push your parents out of being the most important person in your life. But Jesus has to push your spouse out of being the most important person in your life. That Jesus himself has to demote your spouse to second place. That's just the way it is. That's the key to a successful marriage. That's the gospel motivation to live out this dream of God that marriage is about personal holiness, not personal happiness. That's what it says. You have to cultivate that in your heart. Ask for the Spirit to come in. The Word of God has to rest in your heart. That's really the equivalent of Colossians. Be filled with the Spirit. Colossians says the same thing. Let the Word of Christ dwell within you. Let the Word of Christ dwell. Be filled with the purposes and the promises of Jesus. Then you'll have the gospel capital to demote your spouse to second place so that you can have a proper vision for marriage. I shared this poem before, but I think it's, I don't know, I, I like it. <laughs> um, they say it's written by a, a boy named Jason Lehman, 14 years old, and if he wrote this, he has wisdom beyond his years, and this is what he says, sort of pessimistic, but captures maybe the heart of many of us. He says, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. And oftentimes, I think that describes the idolatrous nature of our hearts. That's why Blaise Pascal has one of the beautiful, most beautiful quotes that I always quote here from the pulpit. The mathematician, French philosopher Blaise Pascal said this, In the heart of man is a God-shaped void that only God could fill. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Your spouse cannot fit. It's the wrong shape for that God-shaped void. Your children and your work can't do it either. So if you want to begin to have the capital to relationally absorb the difficulties of marriage, cultivate your reverence for Jesus. Love Jesus more. Fear Jesus more than you do your spouse. Find your identity more in Jesus than your spouse. And ideally, that's how you love your spouse and have a happy marriage. And this leads me to my second point. Gospel love. Let me ask you this question, friends. For both married people as well as those who are single, you know, youth group, I know you want to date. Don't, let's not lie about this. You want to date. I know you do. Um, your parents know it too. Some of us see it on Snapchat. <laughs> why do you want to get married? Why do you want to have a boyfriend and girlfriend? Why do you want to get, why did you get married? Now, these are some reasons that I hear that are understandable. Uh, that's what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? You get married, you have kids, and you go to work. Uh, some people say, I wanted to have children. I wanted a big family. That's my hopes and dreams. Others say, I felt pressure from my parents because I was getting older. Some say I was just physically attracted. You know, he was handsome. She was hot. Now I thought, this is the person for me. Those are legitimate, but those aren't the primary reasons. It's understandable, but not the primary purpose. That's not God's vision. Actually, why did you get married? The purpose and the point is actually holiness. And so it's the gospel dynamics and growth. And marriage helps you to understand the gospel, and gospel helps you understand the marriage. So this is what it says. Even the Apostle Paul, verse 32, he says, This mystery is profound. That pronoun, this, is referring to marriage. Marriage, this mystery, is profound. And as a side note, many people have been married for years. Understand, yeah, marriage is just a mystery. We don't really get it. I don't understand. But he's saying, I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So he's saying this mystery, this marriage is profound, large, heavy, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And so he's saying that the purpose of marriage is holiness. It's about grace. It's about love. And we see this. In the passage, more explicitly, in the description of the husband's role in verses 25 to 27. Let me read that for us, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her from the washing of the water with the word, that he might present her, the church, present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So this is my point. It's, you know, the second point is really about how do you cultivate gospel holiness Personal holiness is through gospel love. And we see the love here shown to us in Jesus for the church. Now, there are three purpose clauses in verses 25 to 27 that show the purpose of Christ's death. Christ gave his life to the church, gave himself up for her. There are three reasons why he did this in verses 26 to 27. Christ died for the church. That he might sanctify her, verse 26. That he might present the church in splendor, verse 26. That he might be, she might be holy and without blemish, verse 27. Actually, the last two are verse 27. And so this is what we see. The order is important here, that there's a purpose to Jesus' love for the church, to make the church holy, which is a purpose for marriage. To make mar- marriage is a purpose for personal holiness. Jesus died for the church that he might sanctify her, that he might present the church in splendor, and that she might actually be holy without blemish. Three strong purpose clauses in these verses, and the order is important. Do you know what the order is? Jesus says, you're not attractive to me, you're my bride, but I'm going to die for you first. He moved first, and it wasn't driven by emotions. It was action and will first before Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. So in order to put it in contemporary terms, it's not if Jesus looked at the church and said, that's my body type, I'm going to die on the cross. He doesn't look at the church and say, yeah, you're, you have the hair type, I like, you're, you get me, you understand me, so I'm going to die on the cross. It wasn't conditional, it wasn't responsive, it was actually unconditional, and it was initiative. Jesus died first, not as a response to the church, but in order to make the church beautiful. And that places really for us how we can cultivate a gospel holiness, a personal holiness in marriage. And this is what it means in terms of gospel love. So much more to say, but we'll focus on this, on love. If you define love biblically, this is what it is. Simply, love is action first, feeling second. So youth group students, do you hear this? You, know, you want to you date somebody? Oh, I love him. When you tell your parents in college, I love him. Love is action first. It's feeling second. Because that's what it says, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to die. First John 3, 16. How do I know what love is? The brother who laid down his life for his brother. It doesn't describe emotional butterfly feelings. Oh, he's so handsome. Oh, she's so beautiful. Love is action first, feeling second. If you go feeling first and action second, you're set for devastation and disappointment. Love biblically, gospel-centeredly, is actually action first, feeling second, because that's what we see in Jesus. He died for the church first to make her clean and to make her holy. That's why you can love your enemy, because you don't have natural affection toward your enemy, but you can live out the gospel imperative. You can love your enemy because love is action first, feeling second. See, most marriages start by feeling first. Most single people want to go by chemistry first, but that's understandable, but it's also maybe not the most biblical because love is actually not attracted attraction physically, but it's an action first. It's a character first. It's a gospel holiness first. Then the feeling comes in secondly. So many people think we fall in love. Even think about the phrase, fall in love, as if it just happens to us and we fall in a ditch or we walk into this kind of smoky room which is called love and all of a sudden we just enter into love. No, love is really volitional. It's an expression of the will. It's real. It's raw. It's really about gospel maturity. Love is action first, emotions second. If you could get this, then you have a key to developing holiness. Why? Because this is what it means. If you understand this aspect of love as shown by Jesus, if you apply it in marriage, you could always show love to your spouse even when you get into an argument. You could always show love to your spouse even when we don't feel like loving her. And it's a real, genuine, biblical love. And this is the key. Even when there's somebody unlovable to you, you can show real love. And when you begin to understand love as action first, emotion second, and continually show love to somebody that you don't love, the Lord works through that and begins to make you feel loving. Does that make sense? When you force yourself by the gospel and make a decision, Jesus loved me, I'm going to love this person, and you just show it through action and through, through love, over time when you do this, slowly the emotions and the feelings follow, even in marriage, even in relationships. That's the way it works. Action is, love is action first, emotion second. See, for those of us, you're all, maybe many of us, we're emotions first. I feel something for that person, then I'll be responsive. That's conditional, that's not necessarily gospel love. Maybe it's more empathy. But if you feel something first and then show action, you're on a road to devastation, disappointment. It just doesn't work like that. You actually become unloving because your feelings are so fickle. They go up and down. So if you're always saying, oh, I'm only going to show action-oriented love when I feel something, it's never going to work. Love is action first, feeling second. 
See, one of the beautiful things that why this is so important is because as Jesus saw the church in our sinfulness and rebellion, he loved us first by action to make us clean and holy. And that's the paradigm for husbands and wives to do this for each other. Because one of the things, this is an illustration, so imagine an architect who wasn't that good, built a bridge, and so there's all kinds of cracks, there's all sort of shortcuts that the architect took. And then you have an 18-wheeler, really heavy, goes onto the bridge, and then stresses and sort of almost breaks and bends the bridge. So this truck is on the bridge, and then you look at the bridge, and all of a sudden the cracks pop out, and you see the, the shortcuts that were taken by the architect, and you see sort of the, the cracks that were painted over so you couldn't see it, but the stress of the truck reveals all the inadequacies and all the cracks in the bridge. That is what your spouse is like for you. The spouse for you is like that truck. It runs through the bridge of your heart and it stresses your life so that it reveals the cracks of your sin, so that it reveals inadequacies and shortcomings of your sin. That's what marriage does. That's why it's about personal holiness, not personal happiness. See, when you're dating, in the beginning, you're good at actually covering up your bridge. You paint it over, you make it look strong and sturdy, you change it to the color that your person that you're dating you like. But once you get into marriage, then the semi comes in and begins to stress your bridge, stress your life so that the cracks and sin come out the way that you talk, the way that you're impatient, the way that you're greedy, the way that you're selfish. And that is why the only way to cultivate personal holiness is to understand that you need gospel love in Jesus to show action love, to, that love is action first and emotion second. And that's what the purpose, the purpose of marriage is. See, Tim Keller in his book, Meaning in Marriage, says it this way. He says, you have to love the person on the first day of your marriage, not for the person you see on the first day, but for what you see the person to be on the tenth year your future glory selves, because who you are on your first day is not going to be who you are on the 10th year of your marriage. It can't be. God uses marriage to change you. Your spouse is not going to be the same person on the first day of marriage as your spouse will be on the 10th year. So that's what he says. You've got to marry somebody with this sort of ministry mindset, this gospel holiness mindset that you're going to change to be more like Jesus. Love the person for who he will be by the grace of Jesus or she will be by the grace of Jesus, not from what you see on the day one. Love your spouse for your future glory self. That's what we see in this passage. Jesus loves the church on day one, dies for the church, but doesn't leave the church like that, but makes her holy, clean, spotless, without blemish. So love your spouse, not as what you see day one, but as what you see the grace of Jesus can make that person on day 2001. That's really the way it works. As the joke goes, you know, on the first day of marriage, you pick a hymn for your wedding and these glorious, majestic hymns. Isn't that the, tr the truth? Think about the hymn that you sang at your wedding. Glorious, majestic truth, because that's the spirit and that's sort of the heart of your first day of marriage. So you say on the first day of marriage, you pick and you sing something like, Behold the throne of God above. After several years of marriage, you're singing a different tune. Many of us sing, Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> that's marriage. That's how it works. But if you have gospel love and a gospel, and Jesus is the most important person in your life, you can make this work. And that leads us to a third point. Very practical. Gospel communication. Gospel communication. Let me try to get through this. So there's an implicit application about gospel communication that love will be reflected in your words. Let me try to make my case so you can see it in the passage. First, it's in the context of Ephesians 5. Paul cares about your words. Chapter 4, 15, he says, speaking truth in love. That's really the main point. Chapter 4, 25, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Chapter 5, verse 4, let there be no full filthiness or foolish talk. Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So he addresses the entire church and he cares about how you talk. Communication is really important. And Paul is very concerned about gospel words and then he fleshes this out most of all in marriage. So in verse 24 of our passage, he says, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Everything, including your words. This is, includes the way you communicate. Husbands are to love and sacrifice Everything for your wives, this includes your words. Even in verse 26, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with a word. Word there means the word of the gospel. Jesus cleans the church through the word of the gospel. In the same way, a husband's words can help cultivate holiness within the wife. So that's the paradigm. The key for gospel communication, as we see it here, is that according to verse 24 and 26, is speaking the truth in love. We need that gospel balance, friends. Now, be, be reflective. We'll go in counseling mode a little bit. This is how you think about speaking the truth in love. Some of you speak truth without love. You're going to break your spouse. 
Speaking truth without love is just someone who's dogmatic, someone who's like harsh, critical. You just yell at your spouse. You just always criticize your spouse. If you speak truth without love, you're going to break your spouse. You're going to devastate your spouse. You're going to hurt your spouse. You're going to fracture your spouse. But on the other hand, for those of us who speak love without truth, then really the words that you say will bounce off your spouse and your spouse will never grow because you're too much about worried about finding security in your spouse. You have a fear of man. You speak love without truth, then the words are going to bounce off. You see how that works? You need both. You need truth in love. You need to speak truth in love. You need truth, words of truth, gospel truth, motivated and delivered with gospel love. That's the way it works. So practically, what does it mean? Let me try to help you out. This is what it means generally. Words have to be contextualized and speak in the world and love language of your spouse. You got to tune your words into the frequency of your spouse. You know, you speak on one wavelength, and this is my analogy, you speak on one wavelength and frequency, and you're like a radio, but you need to tune the dial of your communication so that you begin to tune the frequency of your communication to the radio signal of your spouse. Does that make sense? That's why you're always talking past each other, because you're on this frequency, your spouse is on this frequency. You never really get each other. So gospel communication, truth and love, means don't just speak truth, but deliver it with love. Tune the way you speak to the frequency of your spouse. See, this is how you know where you're out of frequency, where you're speaking a different frequency than the reception of your spouse. Really simple, black and white. This is how you know. Ask your spouse this, do you feel understood? That's it. If your spouse says no, automatically black and white, you are on the wrong frequency. It doesn't matter. You could come up with excuses. You could give up context motivation. Ask your spouse, do you feel understood? And if your spouse says no, you are not speaking on the frequency. You're not speaking truth and love. See, many people think, do you hear the words that I'm saying? Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? That's because you're expecting your spouse to tune up to your frequency of the words coming out, but actually, you got to tune your frequency in the way you speak to your spouse. Ask your spouse, are you in tune? Am I in tune with you? Do you feel understood? Yeah, it's a feeling. That's what it means. So those are kind of abstract principles, but this is what it means practically. And this may be harder depending on who you are. It means something like this. Answer a feeling with a feeling. Don't answer a feeling with a fact. You've got to contextualize. You've got to, you know, Jesus came down and took on human flesh. Answer a feeling with feeling. Don't answer a fact feeling with a fact. See, the way that I communicate, I talk about and I respond, with, you know, I, I respond logically, rationally, logically with facts. That's how I communicate. Uh, so in my marriage, it's tough because you know, sometimes you know, Kathy wants me to respond with emotion. And so I'll let you let in on a, a little secret. You know, for some time, Kathy and I have been trying to have a third kid uh, she had a miscarriage last year. Uh, it was difficult for us. Um, but now we're, she's, still, she's still going at it. <laughs> she wants a third kid. And so we, you know, it gets tense in our marriage, you know, because I just don't see it. <laughs> now, three kids, family with three kids. I love you guys. It's perfect. But for us, you know, maybe not for us. And so when, she's, when I argue this, I'm arguing rationally. I'm on my frequency. It's like, Kathy, it doesn't make any sense. You know, three kids is going to cost more. We're going to have to go to a smaller house. We don't have any in-laws to help us with this. You're going to be tired. You're not getting any younger. That was probably a bad thing to say. But you're not getting any younger. I'm not getting younger. And then for several years, if we have a third kid, it's going to pull my time away from the church, and I don't know if I could do that. It doesn't make any sense. I'll do it if maybe one of our in-laws moves next to us, which she's not necessarily open to. So, Mom, if you're watching the YouTube, don't worry about that. (laughs) But that's how she works. And so this is how she responds to me. Well, I just want it. And who guess, guess who won the conversation? <laughs> now, so pray for us. That's how like, I'm just trying to illustrate my inadequacy, my lack of love to contextualize. So pray for us. Pray that, we could, pray that God will change Kathy's heart to see the truth. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I just got myself in trouble. But that's the example. Contextualize, speak on her frequency. Answer a feeling with a feeling. Don't answer a feeling with a fact. That's what it really means. See, the most important thing through all of this is that you communicate love. That you communicate love. That's the most important thing. No matter the facts and figures, no matter the truth, the most important thing that you communicate because of the gospel is that your spouse feels understood and loved. Now, all of us heard about love languages, you know, behaviors that when others do them, make you feel loved. Some of you are like, time, spend time with me. Spend alone time. Let's communicate. Other people are like gifts. Other people are words of affirmation. Other people are like physical touch. Um, So there's different kind of love languages, what I call different frequencies. The most important thing is to communicate to your spouse so they feel loved. That is the gospel goal. That is gospel communication, to cultivate a marriage with a vision for personal happiness, for personal holiness, not personal happiness. R.C. Sproul gives this wonderful illustration of languages, love languages, and frequency. He says, I like extravagant gifts. My wife likes practical gifts. 
So when it came one year to Christmas time, he wanted a nice set of golf clubs because he likes extravagant gifts. His wife is very practical, so bought him five white shirts because he speaks a lot. He was really disappointed with the gift. His wife wanted practical gifts, so she wanted a new washing machine. R.C. Sproul wanted his extravagant gifts, so what he bought her was a mink coat. She didn't feel loved. They both got extravagant, expensive gifts, but neither of them feel loved because they're not on the same frequency. Now, that's actions, but our words work the same way. You need to know the frequency of your spouse. You need to find that tune. You need to tune the gauge of your heart to have the words of the heart speak gospel truth to speak on the frequency of your spouse. There's no other way around it. That's what it takes. And speaking in truth, love means that in some way you move your spouse closer to Jesus. It means this for some of us, that you know the difference between what you think and feel and what you should actually share in the moment. Sometimes the best way to speak truth in love is actually just to shut your mouth and don't say anything and listen. Sometimes that's the best thing to do. Most of us kind of speak truth right now, especially maybe some of the brothers. I've got to fix this problem now. I've got to help her to understand now. But sometimes gospel communication, speaking truth in love, means shut your mouth and listen to your spouse. And this is maybe a big one. I'm going to close with this. This also means in the daily matters of life, now I know I'm generalizing, so just apply this to your own marriage. Husbands work all day, and sometimes they use the quote of their words. They work all day, and they're done talking whatever their work is, at the office, at work, medical field, whatever it is. They're out there in the work, they're tired, they don't want to talk anymore. Sometimes your wives are at home taking care of the kids all day, and they're ready to unleash the words, an avalanche or like a tidal wave of words because they've just been talking to children. They need adult conversation. So the husband comes home, doesn't want to communicate because he used his words, and he's too tired. The wife is ready to let everything open up and share everything with the words, and so they get into a conflict. Why doesn't she understand me? I'm tired. I'm, th- I'm, I'm working for the family. The wife is like, he's not emotionally connected. She's not, he's not talking to me. What do we do about this? The gospel speaks into this, and it may mean something like this. Contextualize and tune your frequency to your spouse. That may mean the gospel will stretch the husband to speak a little bit more when you're tired, to actually go into your reserves of words and speak more to emotionally connect, ask your wise questions. For the wise, it may mean you may not be able to share or hear from your spouse as much as you would like but the gospel will stretch you because you love your spouse and your spouse will feel loved. That's what it takes. That's gospel communication. That's speaking the truth in love. That is what the Apostle Paul shows us in verses 24 to 27 by the communication of Jesus to the church. See, the the biggest thing here, which we'll look towards next week, is that communication is perhaps the most basic skill to cultivate a gospel marriage. The most basic skill. It's the foundation for your everyday life. If you can't communicate Everything else will fall brittle and won't work. It may be the most biblical gospel skill to cultivating holiness in marriage. It's a foundation for conflict resolution. It's a foundation for forgiveness and repentance. It's a foundation for living life together. If you can't communicate with one another, there's no way you'll have a vision for God's marriage of personal holiness and not personal happiness because you can't do it. And this is not only just shown to us in Jesus, but it expresses itself climactically according to the author of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Long ago and many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. That Jesus is the final way in which God speaks to us climactically and powerfully. And if we look to Jesus as our perfect spouse, if we look to Jesus as the one who has spoken in these last days with the fullness of his glory and revelation, and we lay down our lives before him, and then we embrace Jesus for all that he's got, It'll move us and create us, transform us to speak truth and love to our spouse. It'll make us love our spouse unconditionally. It'll help us to see this grand vision of gospel personal holiness and to have reverence for Jesus according to verse 21 so that we could cultivate a marriage in a way that brings holiness and glory to God, that we could begin to experience these gospel realities between husband and wife. And that is the key to everything, that the Apostle Paul shows us that we live our lives for Jesus, and he laid down his life for us. And if we could speak with the power of the gospel, with loving our spouse in the way that Jesus loved the church, you're going to be set to fly in your marriage. And that's the most important thing to embrace. Please pray with me at this time. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the gift and institution of marriage. And although some of us are young, some of us are single, we are all equal in the image of God. Um, And we are ultimately getting a window into our perfect and final consummate marriage between us and Jesus Christ, who is a perfect bridegroom who modeled and empowered us to live out the commands that you show us and exemplify for us. 
So, Father, I pray for the marriages in this room, that you would bring healing to the marriages, that you would break the hearts of husband and wives in our communication. I pray for the singles here, Lord, that they would not over-desire marriage or relationships too much, but that they would fear and revere Christ Jesus for the sake of the gospel. I pray for the younger people in this church, both in youth group and college, that they would not go uh, off the deep end when they think about relationships and dating and boyfriend and girlfriends, but that they would see that ultimately Jesus is a person that they need and want. So I pray this for New Life Fullerton and ask that you do this in accordance with your will and timing.